Let some witnesses speak for themselves. Giovanni Cavezio, a wine grower. Sorvolavo una zona molto molto conosciuta e non c'era nulla di particolare, no? I was hang gliding over an area I knew well. There was nothing special. My attention was attracted by something unusual. It was going towards the horizon, above the woods. It was something I couldn't define, considering the distance. The shape was about 2,000 meters away, and the closer I came, the more the object became difficult to define. It was hovering like a helicopter, but I realized it was nothing like that. It generated a very strong light and lacked hard outlines. It had a very strong, bright halo of light. When it was three to four thousand meters, it went away from me in a very impressive way. It was so fast that you could barely follow it with your eyes. In form, it was dome-like with three or four objects hanging from the sides. The diameter was between five and ten meters, and it was lead-colored. Within a moment, it had disappeared over the horizon without a sound and without a smoke trail or anything. I wanted to keep it to myself, as these sort of things are unexpected. That evening, when I got home, I didn't even talk to any family about it. Later, when I went to a restaurant, I met a friend interested in hang gliding, who had seen me flying in the area. He insisted I must have seen something special, because he had. Looking up, he'd seen something which he couldn't define, but which had hurtled across the sky and then disappeared. Incontrai un amico interessato di volo libero, il quale mi disse di avermi visto we decided that he had seen the same thing as myself. Insisting Anche io, dopo un momentino di, di così, eh, decisi di, di, di dirgli insomma quello che più o meno avevo visto. In this second interview, we have the experience of another witness. She relates a similar story to many thousands of others, with a harsh halo of light behind which a sphere or disk appears, and then disappears away at very high speed. Miriam Bitsuzero, housewife. I got up to go to the toilet, and the shutters were down. I opened them. I saw a ship on the lawn. My curiosity got the better of me and looked out. I saw something suspended over the house, but I couldn't describe it. It had a white illuminated base, rounded sides with a red band on the right, and a blue band on the left. Its shape was triangular. The center was a kind of pulsating band of light. Was there something solid there? Oh, yes. 
You could see grey bits, but they were covered by the pulsating. It was very quiet. I noticed that the hands of the clock were on three, then quarter past three. Then it was quarter to five. What happened to that lost hour and a quarter? I can't remember what happened. But the next day, my daughter-in-law's mother noticed a strange shape on my left temple. I said I hadn't hurt myself, and it was very small. The sequence is usually the same, a UFO sighting, a temporary absence, and a mark on the head. Perhaps this was an abduction, a strange case, but no different to thousands of others. Several people have said that they saw it, people who work at the airport, including a pilot. After several days, the police took my statement. They also told me to keep the incident quiet. On the theme of abductions, the recent scientific studies of the medical evidence have started to confirm some of these stories. These Swiss witnesses prefer to remain anonymous. Suddenly, in the rear view mirror, I saw a red light about the size of a table tennis ball, which stopped about a meter and a half from my car. It was about 10 by 15 centimeters across. Suddenly, it started to oscillate from left to right. It moved from the left side of the car and then to the right. Everything was bright red, even inside the car. Then at the height of that rock, you can see up there on the right-hand side of the road, the car rose. Before I lost consciousness, I saw the little red ball flip to the back seat. Then at about 30 meters from that building up there, there was a white glow, and I found myself on the road again. This is a rare case of abduction inside the car itself. We know of others in both South America and the USA. It was about 10.30 p.m. Three yellow beacons were suspended about 10 meters over the forest. They shone for about 15 to 20 minutes. They didn't move. I went towards the forest to see what it was. In my opinion, it was a spaceship. It had a distinctive shape and those lights on top of it. Having reached this tree here, I decided to go up the hill for a better view. I went up the slope, and when I reached the hilltop, I found myself face to face with an enormous hemisphere of light, which at the base was between 10 and 15 meters across. I got nearer and my whole body started to shake. In front of me, a UFO was producing a deafening sound, emitting similar vibrations to a transformer. At a point, I ran into a wall of lights as solid as if I'd run into a concrete wall. I got close three or four times, and every time I ran into this wall. After about 15 to 20 minutes, the UFO took off like a helicopter. It went silently except for a slight hissing noise. No more than three minutes later, two Swiss Army Mirage jets flew over. This barrier of light is talked of time and time again by independent witnesses. The following is a statement by a senior airline pilot with years of flying experience, highly trained, and who has been regularly examined by medical experts. Stefano Gera, Swiss Air Captain. I was flying over the Alps in the region of Biasca at 5,000 meters when I saw a light to the north, which a few seconds later I lost from my field of vision. I didn't manage to see it again. 
Luce che pochi istanti dopo ho perso dal campo visivo e non sono più At that moment, another pilot was flying in an easterly direction, in the same area of the Alps, and asked radar if there was an object in the same place where I'd seen my object. It wasn't visible to radar control. The pilot said he saw a strange, unidentified form, which corresponded to the one I'd seen in my airspace. He couldn't explain it, and said apparently it was quite big, but clearly not an aeroplane. Eh, ho avuto occasione di parlare con questo pilota, lui ha dichiarato di aver visto una forma che apparentemente sembrava estremamente grande, eh, abbastanza aguzza, eh, circa tre volte di lunghezza per una volta di altezza, e appunto non era identificabile come un aeromobile, non era identificabile come né piccolo aereo né aereo di linea. Uh, could it have been a meteorite? No, because meteorites move, and this one was stationary. Probably the object didn't show on the ground radar at that point, because it wasn't moving like a normal aeroplane. It was an enormous area of white light, as big as four jumbo jets. According to both pilots, it stopped and then went away and was neither an aeroplane nor a meteorological phenomena. Captain Schmidt, Swissair. The radar station at Maastricht informed us that a UFO was proceeding in a northerly direction. It then turned towards us at a speed to four to five thousand kilometers an hour, very fast indeed. Eventually it stabilized in relation to our position to three nautical miles to our right at 45 degrees. That's about five kilometers from us. We put on the headphones and looked to the right and suddenly there was a, an immense flash in front of us. I hadn't seen anything like it. Very fast and very intense. The radio didn't give any signal. Nothing at all. Maastricht told us that the object stopped for a minute behind us and then went south at great speed. It was traveling four to five times the speed of sound. Later I read the report of the radar controller. After checking the data, he wrote the speed was double that, which means it was 10 to 12,000 kilometers an hour. It went away in a southerly direction. It returned and went away again. It was as if it was playing hide-and-seek with us. The UFO was enormous, very fast, and it was flying at 10 to 12,000 kilometers an hour. It was seen on radar and seemed to play with the airliner not behavior that you would expect of a military or experimental aircraft. And this is how another Swiss air pilot explained his experience. Captain Peter Bircher, Swiss Air. Suddenly the object, which had flown with us for a while, veered and then at top speed disappeared turning through 90 degrees. I think that this behavior would exclude a natural explanation of the phenomenon, since the object resembled no known flying object. It was practically suspended in the air in front of us. It then went away at high speed, veering at 90 degrees in relation to our route. No known flying object can do such a thing. Many civil pilots are reluctant to talk about their sightings of UFOs. They don't want to be ridiculed, and often they want to protect their flight crew. 
Military pilots are bound by official secrecy for the duration of their service. Captain Duvestal, Swiss Air. At first, we thought we were seeing a star, or at least we believe it to be a shooting star. But straight away I told myself that it wasn't possible because of its speed. It fell gently to the horizon and then oscillated a little to the left and then to the right and then left and right. It then returned to its original position. All of this in less than 30 seconds. That's far from normal. Have you spoken about this to military pilots? I've spoken to American military pilots in Alaska. They told me that they've reported many strange things in those out-of-the-way places, but that they weren't allowed to discuss these things. So you think that the military pilots know more than they can uh, tell about UFOs? Have they also observed this kind of stuff and just can't speak about it? Oh, sure, sure. One impressive, well-documented case is reconstructed here by Nippon TV when a 707 was flying over Alaska on the 17th of November, 1986. At 5 p.m. during the flight, Commander Taraoshi observed two red lights getting nearer. The control tower at Anchorage didn't detect anything present in the area. The lights got nearer and nearer. The three pilots felt a wave of heat. Then the lights disappeared. Shortly after, two white lights appeared. The radar screen indicated the proximity of the object, and the object began to shadow the aeroplane in the direction of Fairbanks, Alaska. Thanks to the contrast of the city lights, the crew could see the outline of the object. We couldn't believe our eyes. It was 30 to 40 times bigger than a Boeing 707. We tried to shake off this object, and I veered the 707 away. The control tower asked if we required the intervention of a military fighter. We replied that it would be too dangerous, as an El Al airplane needed to cross our flight path. Towards 6 p.m., the object disappeared. The sighting lasted for an hour. These are the sketches by Captain Taraoshi. Both he and his crew saw an enormous UFO. It was under control, and he felt there was every possibility that it hadn't been constructed on Earth. As well as the testimonies, there are photographs and film sequences which document UFO sightings. These have been gathered from all over the world, including films shot in the skies over Mexico, taken by a group of video activists calling themselves vigilantes, who have about a hundred members. We're a group of friends from the four corners of Mexico. We always have video cameras with us, at work, at school, so that we're always ready to film a UFO as it appears. The film sequences have been examined by the Institute for Information Science at Seoul University in Mexico City. They subjected the film to a battery of advanced tests. Our work consisted of verifying that there were no distortions of the photographs or any elements of the detail in the video recordings which might have cast doubt on their authenticity. 
Besides computer verification, we also checked on the spot, interviewed witnesses and evaluated witness credibility. In this video, shot in 1991, during a total eclipse of the sun, the television camera focused on a bright object in the sky. It then panned down to the roofs to establish the relative position and distance of the UFO. Here is the object on the film editor's screen. It's like a spinning top or a saucer which is turning. And now another UFO in the Mexican sky. Let's look at it again on the editor's screen. These are totally amazing images. This is 1992. Watch the UFO as it moves about the sky. Here it is, captured closer. Nineteen ninety four and another UFO. This time in the skies over Mexico City itself. Sometimes the UFOs present themselves in formation, like this sighting in 1994. The question as to the authenticity of the films seems to have been answered by Professor Quesada. To be a hoax, they would have had to have falsified the film on hundreds of videos taken by the vigilantes. A very expensive conspiracy. Who could possibly gain from it? Here are still photographs taken by Paul Trent, a farmer in Oregon in 1950. These have been verified by military aviation laboratories in the USA. Here is a photo of a UFO taken in Germany and a thermographic analysis. These are two photographs taken in New Mexico, USA, in 1992, near the Manzana atomic base. UFO sightings are common over these kind of facilities. And this is a long series of photos taken in 1987 by a Mr. and Mrs. Walton in the Gulf Breeze area of the USA. Some claim that there are hoax but examination of photographs by a leading expert has confirmed their authenticity. I was confronted with the problem of, um, could this be real? Uh, it was hard to imagine that Mr. Walters could hoax photos and then have everybody else, have so many other witnesses agree with him. It would have to be a grand conspiracy. Or else, other people were seeing something and he was photographing it. 
In any case, I uh, studied the photos very carefully. Uh, my conclusion is that all those sightings were real. It's important to remember that the same phenomenon was photographed in other countries at the same time. As you can see from the following examples, there are many kinds of UFOs. Another element in the study of UFOs is the examination of traces that are left on the ground where alleged sightings have taken place. Sometimes a whitish substance falls from the UFO. Its analysis has given some disconcerting results. What have we found so far? There are two important things. The first was that the ground was not burnt as we thought. It was, in fact, crystallized by microwave radiation. The microwave in question would have been 50 million times stronger than an industrial oven. Imagine the power of it. We managed to test the phenomenon in the laboratory. Galileo would have been proud of us. We demonstrated the cause of the crystallization, and nobody can say it isn't true, because we did it under laboratory conditions. We examined deposits formed on the ground by the UFOs, and these gave us some disconcerting results. In 1957, a deposit from a UFO was analyzed, and it was found to contain magnesium, a magnesium much heavier than anything known on Earth. It didn't have a nucleus, and it was really much heavier than our magnesium. It was definitely magnesium from space. The French, in 1967, found a similar deposit. And this was also magnesium, and it was much heavier than terrestrial magnesium. I have a simple conclusion from all of this, and other evidence. I'm absolutely convinced it was of extraterrestrial origin. On this planet, we don't have the technology to make this form of magnesium. I'm convinced of this. And what do the authorities say about UFOs? For many years, they've denied or ridiculed these stories, but their attitude has now partially changed. We saw a big object in the sky which we couldn't identify. It had very powerful lights which were directed at the ground. In 1989 and 1990, there were numerous sightings of a UFO in Belgium by more than 2,000 civilians and numerous police patrols. It was a triangular object with three lights at the top and one in the center. It was flying silently at very low altitude just above the ground. This photograph of the object, complete with thermographic analysis, is a filmed sequence. Belgian military aviation authorities have officially joined a collaborative study of the case. After ground radar revealed the presence of the object, some jet fighters were scrambled to intercept the UFO, but without success, because the object performed some incredible maneuvers, demonstrating it was in some way guided. Was it an experimental military aircraft like the stealth bomber. The US government has denied this possibility. The stealth bomber is also noisy and 
The question is, why would a foreign experimental plane fly at low altitude over a densely populated area? Belgian Air Force General Charles de Brewer held a press conference on the 18th of December, 1989, to confirm that they had intercepted UFOs. His written report states, there were no signs of danger. The mystery of their origin remains, but the phenomena exists. It is real. The UFO sighted over Belgium is very similar to that sighted over Ticino by our Swiss housewife and the UFOs filmed over Pueblo in Mexico. Other official confirmation includes the president of Brazil, President Kubicek, who in 1958 declared that a Brazilian Navy ship had sighted and photographed a flying saucer. These are the documents. Spain has recently declassified some documents which confirm the sightings of UFOs. In June 1976, on the Canary Islands, hundreds of people saw a white light which admitted rays. It is written by a local military commander. In addition, there are accounts of humanoids being seen during UFO landings. Still in Spain, a highly luminous disk was seen to come out of the sea. This sighting was confirmed at the same time in Italy. In 1978, the three pilots of a Spanish supercaravel flying over Valencia saw three red lights, which seemed to be at first on a collision course and then to dance in front of the aircraft. The caravel was forced to make an emergency landing and fighters were scrambled to intercept, but they failed to make contact. In 1975, on the Bidenes Reales military base near Navarra, a UFO was seen at low altitude. Until the end of 1990, the Spanish government had always denied the existence of any UFO file. And the same goes for the UK. Before 1990, there had only been the occasional comments as we list here. Lord Dowding, the air chief in 1954, suggested that 10,000 UFO sightings have been made and recorded. He also asserted that these were of extraterrestrial origin. In 1954, an RAF pilot named Saladin encountered some UFOs. This is Saladin's sketch. Ralph Noyes, Defense Secretary, is said by 1964 to have seen Air Force film of UFOs. In 1978, an English policeman, Tony Dodd, saw a UFO with a colleague. Then, in 1980, it was the turn of PC Alan Godfrey. And yet, as we have seen, there was no official confirmation of the sightings. All were treated as top secret. This secrecy has extended to the highest levels, with Chief of Staff Admiral Hill Norton declaring that he was kept in the dark on the existence of a special UFO department. An exceptional case from Woodbridge in Suffolk involved what is believed to be a case of broken down UFO. Air Force police patrols who went to the spot described the object as metallic and resting on three legs, emitting a strong white light. As they got closer to the object, the engines of their cars cut out and the radio contact was lost. This is not science fiction. The episode is confirmed in a report by the deputy commander of the base, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt. In it, you can read that the next day, traces left by the object were found on the ground. According to the reports of the Air Force patrol, 
three humanoids were seen to leave the UFO. They were approximately one meter tall, with big heads and dressed in silver. The commander of the base, General Gordon Williams, is reported to have said that the creatures seemed to communicate by a series of gestures and telepathy. This encounter has never been officially confirmed. France. In February 1974, the then Minister of Defence, Robert Gallet, declared in an interview that for 20 years the French had been studying UFOs. The results of the official studies were published, including the analysis of traces left by two UFOs in 1975 and 1981 in the south of France. An extract from the report states, The physical phenomenon exists. Its place of origin, method of propulsion and behaviour are all beyond human comprehension. Since this, all information has virtually been embargoed by the French. Italy, since 1978, has listed its sighting of UFOs. These are the sightings listed in the 80s. Italy, since 1978, the Swiss government has often said that it pays little credence to the UFOs. But since 1990, the Federal Military Department has given free access to a map showing civilian UFO sightings. No military sightings are recorded. On this map are two reports of sightings by military radar. The first on August the 2nd at 11 p.m. This UFO sighting lasted for a whole hour. It wasn't a meteorite as it moved in a zigzag fashion. It wasn't birds because of high speed and they ruled out aircraft. On the 13th of June 1993, Radar showed a UFO moving not horizontally, but vertically over a military base. With changes of altitude from 5,500 meters to 8,500 in a few minutes. The object was also capable of moving from 8,000 meters to 20,000 meters in a few seconds. The experts have also not commented on this photograph, which shows a UFO spotted by a Swiss Army Mirage. The photograph has been certified as genuine by computer analysis. In the Soviet Union, in 1990, a short while after the sightings in Belgium, General Igor Moltsev, Supreme Chief of the Soviet Air Force, admitted the existence of alien UFOs and extraterrestrial life forms. He said that some MiGs had observed a saucer of 100 to 200 meters in diameter, which was also able to stay motionless in the air and which performed extraordinary aerial maneuvers. Ground radar had confirmed this phenomenon. The Soviet defense chief had decided not to attack the UFO. He calculated such an attack would be pure folly. In 1991, KGB documents reported that an atomic base in Kaspusin Yar had sighted a UFO over the base for two hours in 1989. During its flight, the UFO emitted a ray of light which seemed to inspect the installation. In 1984, a UFO was seen in the Ukraine, above a missile base, but no intervention was possible. After the UFO left the airspace of the base, the guidance systems for the missiles used on the base were found to be inoperative. All the systems had to be reprogrammed. U.S. atomic bases have experienced similar systems malfunctions after UFO appearances. The Berlin Wall fell in 1989, and the official Soviet news agency TASS, for the first time, reported the landing of a UFO at Veronesh. Some children and numerous adults were witnesses. 
TASS reported that the Varanash UFO had landed humanoids and robots. This episode was repeated three times. The witnesses were questioned by Western experts and were thought to be credible. Studies of traces left by the UFO revealed substances not known on Earth. The disk had the form of an egg. It was 15 meters high and 5 to 6 meters long. On the basis of the Earth's disturbance, it had to weigh at least 11 tons. Even in the US, UFO sightings are classified as top secret. However, the door has been opened a crack by the law on freedom of information brought in in 1970. This was a law supported by President Jimmy Carter, who saw a UFO in 1969 when he was a state governor, as you can see from this document. The law allows access to secret documents as long as it doesn't compromise national security. From these documents come important revelations. Some army veterans started to tell of their experiences. These veterans faced a barrage of abuse designed to discredit them. One of these was Wendell Stevens. In 1947, he was transferred from the Roswell base in New Mexico, where he had studied captured enemy aircraft, to Alaska. In Alaska, his squadron was detailed to reconnoiter the area. It soon became clear to Stevens that his real mission was to photograph UFOs sighted in the region. And my crew reported seeing a disc-shaped object sitting on the ice field that rose into the air and flew away as they approached it. Now, for us to launch a B-29 in Alaska, it took a field of equipment bigger than the B-29, heaters, power units, supply, uh, lubricating units, gasoline units, everything to get one B-29 airborne in, in Arctic airspace. It would take us several hours to get it ready to go. Here's an object that's sitting on the ice field with no support equipment that jumps into the air and flies away and leaves nothing behind it. Now that was, in our view, was an impossibility because we could, there's no way we could approach anything like that. Then a, a report came in of seeing one emerge from below the water, sit on the water from a surface of the water from rise into the air, and then zip off flying away. Another one at another time was reported to have descended into the water and disappeared. None of our aircraft could do any of that. Another important case is that of the then Lieutenant Graham Bethune during a 1951 flight from England to the US on a C-54 transport. The incident was confirmed by the whole crew. We began to see lights. There was a pattern of lights on the water, right on the water. And the size of this pattern of lights were really disturbing because it looked like many ships or aircraft carriers or what have you tied up and maybe a ring of lights. So we didn't know what was going on. We passed over the guard ship, which is a weather ship, which reports the weather to us, any ships in the area and this type of thing. So there was no ships in the area. There was no activity in the northern lights or over hours. There was nothing plotted in the area, so it really, you know, we wonder, well, what are we seeing? Maybe they're doing some secret type of recovery or something in the water. The, the next thing we saw was like a, a old, small halo about 25 miles away. That halo came to us like that, that 25 miles, that fast. And, of course, uh, I disengaged the autopilot because the size of this thing, we couldn't see anything else out of the cockpit except that craft. And, and when I started to push the nose over to go under, uh, it stopped about 15 degrees off the bow, about 200 feet below us, maybe 1,500 feet out in front of us. And at that time, it was above the horizon. At night, you know, it's very difficult to see any, but we could see, we could see the dome. We could see it was a dome-shaped ship. We could see roughly the size of it. Then, immediately, it pulled away about five miles away on a, at an angle and sat there and flew with us. This is the official report of the episode. In another case, in 1954, Army pilot Mel Knoll 
was part of a squadron asked to film UFOs in the skies over the USA. Their film sequences of UFOs were shown at the base. We were shown a, in the, somewhere in the area of 600 still photographs and a fair quantity of gun camera film that had been exposed just coincidentally with, uh, with the sighting. Soon the squadron sighted five objects without managing to film them. It was five days later. We ran into either the same or another five. And at that time, we, we felt we succeeded in uh, getting them on the film. And approximately, well, I think it was a week after that, we ran into a total of 16 of the things and we were having at that point we were having some relatively severe psychological problems these were pilots in their early 20s defenseless in the face of the ufos while they were observing them something incredible happened in their headphones they heard a voice which said in english that they'd come in peace but they were worried about what man was doing and that the voice they were hearing was not a hallucination. Their purpose of being here was to uh, dissuade some of the influence. They, they made refer reference to nuclear uh, development by man and the problems that would be created and had been created from it. And uh, it's, uh, at, at the age of 21, it... Uh, it placed us in severe quandary of questioning and capability and opposing side ego and, and experience, but um, it, there was no humor. I mean, it was not fun at all. Here we have some official documents which are now being made public. General Nathan Twining prepared a study on UFOs in 1947 the chief of the staff of the Pentagon, George Shulgan. It contains the chilling conclusion that based on the evidence at the time, that UFOs are real, that they're capable of extraordinary flight with amazing changes of direction, which made the writers think they must be guided by some alien intelligence. They were even seen to fly in formation and that their origin and technology were unknown. This 1947 document is now in the public domain. One of the great unsolved mysteries is the question of alien remains from one of these objects. From the many statements, it would seem that in 1947 near Roswell, New Mexico, one or more saucers or disks had crashed, perhaps because of local experiments with electromagnetic radiation. Mac Brazel, a farmer, harvests some strange materials and took them to the airbase at Roswell. They included unknown materials with writing on them, similar to hieroglyphics. The base commander examined them and in a press release declared them to be the remains of a recovered UFO. A few hours later, General Ramey, under orders from the Pentagon, denied the fine and said the debris was the remains of a weather balloon. Roswell is a much discussed incident. The official documents in 1947 have the handwritten notes of FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover. On them it says, the FBI must have access to the recovered UFO. Another thorny question has been, were alien corpses recovered from the crashed spacecraft? An internal memo from an FBI operative to his chief, J. Edgar Hoover, indicates that they were in possession of the debris of three flying saucers, each one with the remains of a small humanoid dressed in a silver suit. This document was released in 1983 and its contents confirmed by Professor Robert Saarbacher. He was directly involved in the UFO research project in the 40s. Saarbacher writes, the UFO was constructed of a light and resistant material. The humanoids had internal organs similar to insects. A hoax? Many analysts think not. But why is it all kept so secret? Was it to make sure that there was no public panic? 
with the US government afraid to admit that they were powerless in the face of a UFO menace. Perhaps they wanted to gain technological advantage from recovered materials. Whatever the reasons in 1947, a massive cover-up operation began. A number of supposed research projects were set up to calm public opinion and create confusion about the phenomenon by means of disinformation. They were codenamed Grudge, Sign and Blue Book. The real research took place under the greatest secrecy within the project Majestic 12, a project run by Professor Van der Vaar Bush, now dramatized in the UFO series Dark Skies. This document from Majestic 12 was donated anonymously to a researcher in 1984. It is a memo from President Eisenhower. It states that on the 7th of July 1947, a UFO came to Roswell with a humanoid on board, but it had been reported to the press that it was merely a weather balloon. Many say that the Eisenhower note is a fake. This document from 1950 would seem to question that view. The Canadian engineer, Wilbert Smith, indicates to his government that the subject of UFOs is more secret than the atomic bomb. A group led by Professor Bush have been asked to carry out a research project called Majestic 12. Since that time, many incidents have occurred, including a possible alien landing at Fort Dix, which included alien casualties. And in 1993, an alien craft may have disabled the nuclear arsenal at Manzano in the former Soviet Union. With these spectacular video pictures of a UFO, we conclude this part of UFOs, The Complete Truth. These are genuine pictures. UFOs exist, but many questions remain as to their origin, purpose, and the intelligence that guides them. Questions that we will deal with in the later three parts of our investigation. Cosmic Watergate, ancient astronauts, and ultra-secrets. Watch them and make up your own mind. <laughs>